Welcome to the Pursuit of Learning podcast. I'm your host, Clint Murphy. My goal is for each of us to grow personally, professionally, and financially one conversation at a time. To do that, we will have conversations with subject matter experts across a variety of modalities. My job as your host will be to dig out those golden nuggets of wisdom that will facilitate our growth. Join me on this pursuit. Today, I talk with Bodine Sanders in a two-part conversation about race, diversity, and inclusion. Bodine grew up playing football in Jacksonville, Florida for an all-black high school and was a walk-on at Division II Cheney University a historically black college with a rich history. Bo Dean then transferred to Villanova's Division I football program, a dream for Bo Dean and a learning experience as he joined a predominantly white football program. Listen to learn Bo Dean's journey and join an important conversation. Bodine, welcome to the Pursuit of Learning. I want to start our conversation where you start your book off. And that was at your high school graduation. A few things jumped out at me. The first thing was that you mentioned your school was 99% black and that more and more black men were dropping out of high school or not going to college. What do you think the driver of that was when you were back in high school? And have you seen that evolving over the last 20 years? Well, Clint, thanks for, first of all, for having me. I appreciate you inviting me on your show. Yes, uh, I'll answer the latter question first. It has changed. And so don't let me forget to answer that in depth. But I was born in 1965 which is right at the heart of here in America, our civil rights movement. So the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. The Voting Rights Act was passed the year I was born in 1965. So you can imagine, based on how much of our history you know about Jim Crow laws and you know further back slavery, you can imagine what the culture and relationships were like in the South, right? So I graduated high school in 1983. And it's a, and I don't want it to sound like an excuse, but if the government was not investing in communities of color, but they were investing in police departments or investing in other areas, then African-American men, disappointed, disillusioned, um, saw no reason to continue high school if they didn't see a future for themselves in what they aspired to be, right? So I was lucky. I wanted to be a football player. Well, what if a guy wanted to be a business owner? Maybe he wanted to own a car wash, he didn't want to go to he didn't have to go to college to, to own a car wash. He had to have the funds. Right. And all those other things, business plan, all those things we know a business owner would need to borrow money from the bank. But what if the banks didn't loan money to a person of color? Maybe the person of color had to jump through hoops versus a person equal to that 20 year old African-American and that other person would be white. Right. So there were so many hurdles and barriers for people of color in general. Right. You may and you may have heard this term before, but here in America, we grew up repeating to each other that people of color had to be twice as good as our white brothers and sisters in order to achieve something. Right. So if you think about all those barriers, then some guys probably gave up and said, hey, I'll sell drugs or I'll quit school or I'll just do whatever, hustle to make ends meet, to survive, then deal with going to college and having to work hard, study hard, 
and 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 then go from there. So I mean, I'm kind of simplifying it, but I'm sure there are it was is much more complicated than that. But those are some of the issues I can think of why someone my age, 18 years old, decided to quit high school in the 11th grade. Maybe they had family issues at home. Mom needed help. So he quit school to get, you know, whatever job he could get to help mom pay bills, which is what I did after I graduated high school. Yeah, that's right. So I'm hearing a few things, actually. Part of part of what would come out of what you're saying is given that time frame, And given the generation before you, there may have been a lack of role models to show you you could do it. There may have been some systemic race issues that made it unaffordable or unattainable in the eyes of the young men in your generation at that time. Absolutely. I'll use, instead of assuming and guessing, I'll use a perfect, a good example. My dad was in the military for six years. I guess that was during or around the Vietnam War period. And after he got out of the military, he and his brother and a few friends formed a band. And my dad basically self-taught himself how to be a musician. He could play multiple instruments. Today at 81, 82 years old, he's a music teacher still, but the opportunities for him were limited, Mm -hmm. right? He had a little bit of success, but any grandeur opportunities were difficult because if you think about, I was born in 1965, that means he had a band 1955 to 1960, let's say in that time frame. Can you imagine um, a small band traveling in the South from one location to the next, right? So they had limited, right? And there was a movies out there yeah, that the, kind of depict what life was like. I think it was a Sam Cooke movie and, and maybe some other movies. So he, he was not one of the lucky ones that was able to advance his career. So that's kind of a good example of how difficult it was. Mm -hmm. And is that movie The Green Book? Is that the one you're referring to? I didn't see it, but that's what I remember, a movie that came out maybe a year or two ago, The Green Book. Mm, That's a good example of, you know, folks who did make it through. But, you know, as they say, even in sports, (laughs) for every one million kids, only a handful are going to make it to, to the pros, regardless of what sport it is. Right. So. He was one of the ones that didn't make it to big time. So he had to do whatever he had to do, which was pivot, get a job and and support his family. And my dad, I would describe and I may have described it in the book. I'm not sure. But my dad is an Urkel. If you remember that character called Urkel, uh, my dad is not a street guy. He is not a athletic looking guy. He's a Urkel. He's a musician, right? He's that's that's what he he looks like, you know, glasses, can play, you know, multiple multiple instruments. So, and the reason I say that is because he does not fit the stereotype of the big black man, right? My dad's shorter than me. Matter of fact, I think he was shorter than my mom. <laughs> so, so yeah, so he he didn't fit the typical description, negative description of a black man. So if he had it hard, imagine someone who would fit in the negative stereotype of a black man, how hard they would have it. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense what you're saying there. The one thing that was interesting, and I, I think you saw it even with your older sister, was you made a specific note that you didn't see the same issue with the women that you were in school with, that more of them were finishing high school or making the decision to go to college. What do you think was the driving difference between the two groups? Mothers. Mothers. Right? Mothers. If you think about that time frame, mothers, if they they couldn't keep their sons and pry their sons away from the streets, 
Then they focus that energy on the girls. On their daughters. On their daughters. Oh, wow. Right? So my mom didn't graduate college. And I'm not even sure, again, if I wrote this in a book, but um, I don't think my mom graduated from high school. Because in the South, back in the day, if the guy was 21, 22, 23, and the young lady was 14, 15, 16, as long as both parents agreed, they could get married. And that was in, that was my mom and my dad in their case, right? So my mom stressed education and my sister was, you know, the recipient of all that energy. And because in my household, my mom had four kids. Papa, as a musician, was a rolling stone. So I have other sisters. <laughs> I don't call them half sisters, but they have different mothers, right? And so I have other sisters, but in my house, I grew up, my sister, my brother, me, and my, what I call my Irish twin. So my sister being the oldest sibling in the household, she was, and she, and all my sisters are smart, um, but she was academically smart. So we knew she was going to go to college. The question was, where is she going to go and what could she afford and my mom afford, right? So that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, she was destined to go to college and she did. And so, both of you graduated college. You didn't mention in the book your Irish twin sister and <laughs> your brother. Did they also go to college or what was their path? I mentioned my brother very softly. Mm -hmm. He was in the military, That's he right. did not go yeah. to college. Okay. And so he went to the military after high school. And then my Irish twin, who's less than a year younger than me, and as I describe in the book, people in the neighborhood and, and everywhere would say we were like twins, you know, and I say, no, no. People would say we're just, we're a lot alike. And I say we're more than alike. We're like twins because mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. had the same personality, the same, you know, mannerisms. We were both thin. Uh, at one point she was taller than me and then I had a growth spurt. <laughs> so we, we were basically two peas in a pod. So, and, uh, we pretty much did almost everything together, fights, track. So yeah, but she did not go to college. However, okay. she still today works for the police department and I've been trying to convince her to retire, but she's pretty close to retirement. So she's been working with the, the, my hometown police department for easily 30 years. The next thing that really jumped out about your high school graduation was you had a teacher, Miss Vaughn, who wanted you to go to college for academics. And you wanted to go to college to play football, not for academics. If it was just academics, you said, I'm going to stay home and work and help my mom out financially and help my older sister go to college. Where did that single-minded focus and determination come from? Because even, even without going straight to college, it didn't appear there was a path, but every day you were working out as if, and maybe that's just as if dot, dot, dot. You knew something was coming. Where, where did that come from in you? You know, that's a great question, Clint. I, I don't know where it came from. I know what I felt. And what I felt was, and maybe I was just naive, <laughs> right? But I refused to believe that I didn't have the ability to play football somewhere. Um, I believe that because, and I, you know what? Now that you made me think about it, let me take a step back. Because my mom didn't allow me to play sports like she allowed to play my brother, maybe that's where it came from. Because you remember in the book, I write about staying after school to try out for the basketball team in elementary school. And because my brother did and my mom didn't have a problem. So I decided to do the same thing. And the next thing I know, I see my mom who walked from our house to the elementary school and pulled me off the basketball court and said that to the coach, you can keep that one, meaning my brother, but you can't keep this one, meaning me. And she literally pulls me off the court by my ear and we walk back home. She would not allow me to play sports at all. So 
once I got to the point where my uncle, which was my my mom was the oldest of her siblings. She had five sisters and two brothers. So my mom's youngest brother, who can't be more than seven or eight years older than me, would hound my mother about letting me play football because I would hound him to get him to hound her about letting me play football. So by the time he almost came to a had a fist fight with my mother to allow me to play sports, I guess that feeling of wanting to do something and being denied it stuck in me. And then when I was able to try out for the team, scared out of my wits, right? I didn't, in other words, I didn't play peewee football, Pop Warner football, Little League football, neighborhood football. I was a late bloomer. I was behind the curve, right? So when I walked on the field for the first day, put on my shoulder pads and helmet, I had to demonstrate to the coaches that I could play football without ever being taught how to play football from a coach. I basically self-taught or my uncle had something to do with walking me through, talking me through, going to football games, watching it on TV. And so when I was able to make the team, I guess that accomplishment stayed in me where the will and the drive to want to play and then making it that great feeling once I was denied the opportunity, I don't say denied, once I didn't get the opportunity or earn the opportunity to go to college, I had something to fall back on, meaning a disappointing feeling. And that kept me working out because also, as I wrote in the book, I saw on TV during Christmas time, which is usually bowl football season, right? And then you hear the stories of athletes who either transferred from a junior college or they were Mormon and they went on a mission. And after their mission, they came back and then went to college. So there were a lot of late bloomers. And you heard a lot of stories about guys trying out for a team as a walk on, you know, maybe they had academic issues, whatever. But there were so many great feel good stories out there about guys getting the opportunity who didn't get it the traditional way of a scholarship. So that also kept me going and saying, there's an opportunity. I just got to find it. I just got to find it. And, and you, so how old were you when you would have started playing then age grade? Were you around grade seven? Grade eighth grade, eighth grade was when you started. Okay. We, we called it junior high. Nowadays they junior call it middle high, school. That's right. Yep. Okay. Yep, so, and, and so you would have been 13 ish. Yep. Yep. That's my, my oldest son. That's he turns 13 in four or five months and he just started football touch this um, summer, just a few weeks ago. And I would agree and with that. Touch, fir- touch first. Yep. Touch yep, flag yep. football. Let his body mature. No head banging. Now that mm-hmm. we know about concussions, they say the brain isn't developed yet. And then if he falls really, really in love with it, by the time he gets to high school, then that's another decision you and your wife. and Yeah, he, he's going to – the school that he's going to for high school, um, they have a big football team. And so – and he's a – he's actually a, a very big boy. I think he got my brother's genetics. So he's going to be a, a football basketball boy. Good. So it'll be uh, – those will be his Good. two. Good. But yeah, so okay. So you started a bit late. And did you – you also went through a late growth spurt. Yes. So when you first started, you weren't as, you know, I'm picturing by the time you graduated high school, you would have been about 6'2", 185, 190. But you got that, yeah, you got that very late, right? I got it late. So as I said earlier, I was smaller than my Irish twin Mm -hmm. until I had a growth spurt of eating ice cream every day during the summer, one summer. (laughs) And what age would you say you really got your size would that have been grade 11 or 12 i think it was my the the summer leading into my 11th grade year yeah so you didn't you didn't get much time to really learn how to use that size and throw your weight and strength around to display what you could do right and right. and so you had a late start mhm and then opportunity came knocking you mentioned christmas 
your sister, you didn't realize she was working behind the scenes with some friends to get you an opportunity for college. Tell us what that was like when you found out you had a way in. Well, I I was work after graduation. I got a job at the local mall and was selling suits and menswear and and saw kids as I would catch the bus. Uh, I saw kids. um, You would think a kid graduating high school would want a car, right? (laughs) I didn't want a car. That wasn't something I was interested in. So my money was going towards the opportunity to go to college and then help my mom out around the house with bills so she can kind of focus on my sister and her her tuition and the things that pop up for kids in college. So um, I would catch the bus. I'd see kids going to either summer practice or fall practice. And, and, and that kept me going in terms of working out. Right. And so my sister and my godmother, who lived across the street, saw me putting in the work. Right. There's one thing to say you want to do something. There's another thing if people see you working at it so you can accomplish it. Right. So, you know, we down south call it selling wolf tickets or talking at the side of your neck. You know, Mm -hmm. saying you're going to do something but never do it. Well, my sister saw me working out when she come home for break because her college is about two hour, two hour drive away. My godmother saw me working out because when I work, I come home, change my clothes, walk outside and do wind sprints in the street. So my godmother had a chance to look out her bedroom window before she went to bed to check on me. My mom would look out the window to see if I was okay. Right. So they saw me putting in the work. And so I guess they said in their mind, he's serious. He wants to go to college. He wants to play football. Let's get him in somewhere versus my idea was to play big time football, which was Auburn, Alabama, Florida, Florida State, you know, Kentucky, you know, South Carolina, you know, the big schools, the SEC and ACC schools. Right. Yeah, That's what I yeah. saw on TV. Right. Of course. So but you can't get everything. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was already used to disappointment because, remember, I got switched from a defensive back to an That's offensive right. lineman to help the team be a better team. Right. So I already was used to the disappointment of not playing the position I thought I could play and that would help me get to college. But accepting that fact, working out, playing that position, doing the best I could because the coach says, we need you in order to help the team win. And it was the right decision. I was voted the Fellowship of Christian Athlete of the Year, represented my team uh, for that award. And so... Holiday season comes. My sister comes home for Christmas break. I walk in the house one night. Really, a a very important part was I had a classmate at Cheney University. With her? Well, no, no. My sister was at Bethune-Cookman down in Daytona Beach. Oh, she was. Okay. Apologies. One of her classmates, high school classmates, was also at Cheney. So that was the connection. So I had a teammate, one of her classmates who was two years older, was a was at Cheney. So based on those connections, you know, who you know, what you know, that kind of thing, relationships, mm-hmm. right? She was able to put put the package together, make the connections. And next thing you know, I walk in the house and I thought there were a lot of cars in the driveway. So I thought, hey, Reggie's here. Carl's here. Everybody, they're here to say goodbye because they're you know, getting ready to go back to school for the beginning of the second semester. And next thing I know, they're telling me I'm going with them. <laughs> right. They're, they're telling me that I was accepted at the Ch- into Cheney University and I would be going with them. So that was my Hail Mary. That, that was Reggie was on the football team, was he not? Yeah, because Reggie graduated with me. So with you and he was on your football team. Yeah, so he started in the fall of 83. So he had already been there one semester. And then come January, we're now traveling back up. So I'm starting in the spring of 1984, January to May. Now, when you were going there, you were 
in your mind, you were thinking, I'm going to walk on this team. But when you signed to go, that wasn't known yet, right? You were just like, okay, well, he was my teammate in high school. He's on the team. I know how I am relative to him. I'm going to make this team. Correct. My sister had had it with me finding, using my resources to find a way to get into college, right? So she took the initiative to say, let's get him into college. Because she probably knew the longer I waited for an opportunity, the longer it would take to get me into somewhere, right? And she knew at that point that starting at Cheney, a Division II school with a football team, would be better than me staying home, going to a local junior college or whatever, and just you know earning a degree, not playing football. She knew I'd be miserable. But she also knew that the chances are I could be at the wrong place at the wrong time and be one of those statistics of a black kid at a nightclub or at a restaurant and a gun fight breaks out and you know you hear those stories that's when those stories started when i was in high school that's when the drive by shootings started to happen that's when a lot of gunplay and you would hear stories of a great athlete or a good athlete or a student being at the wrong place at the wrong time and so she didn't want she she didn't want that for me so she was perfectly fine with me heading up north okay and so you ended up going to you already said the name, but you went to Cheney College with a rich history, and it was an HBCU. For our listeners who don't know what an HBCU is, can you fill them in on that and a bit of the rich history of Cheney as well? Absolutely. HBCU, that acronym means Historically Black College or University. And folks may have heard a lot of it in the past year, if they follow the media and American news, because our vice president graduated from one of the top elite HBCUs called Howard University. So a lot of folks have now gotten used to hearing that acronym a lot lately. Uh, Athletes, be it our white brothers or white sisters, have heard of HBCUs because generally their teammates had filled them in on the opportunity. You know, you can think of a kid in high school. Do I want to go play football at Grambling or do I want to go play football at Ohio State? So athletes have heard of HBCUs, but maybe the general public in terms of kids may not have heard of it. So I get to Cheney. Cheney is the oldest HBCU in the United States. It was founded in 1837. So Clint, think about it. 1837, I'll get to that point. I was about to redirect folks. In 1837, that's before the Civil War. Pennsylvania is a free state. It's not a slave state. It's surrounded by slave states, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, right? All the way down south. So Life is different if you're a person of color and you lived in Pennsylvania and versus if you lived in the southern states, right? It may not have been horribly different, but it was still different. So, again, I've come to find out based on history that life was still difficult for people of color in free states. It just wasn't legal to own them, right? So, um, so if you think about the history of Cheney University. And it reverts back to my history. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. My grandmother was one of the head ushers. We would get up on Sunday mornings. A big yellow bus would come to our house. We'd walk out the door, get on the bus, and the bus would take us to church. And we go to what's called Sunday school. And then after Sunday school, we'd have a break. And then we would go to actual church service. That's why people who aren't familiar with black churches are surprised to find out that church for us is not a two hour or a one hour event. It could be an all day event. Right. And so if you go to church, you learn discipline. (laughs) 
<laughs> right? You learn you got to sit in your seat. No horse plan, no child plan. You got to pay attention. So, but you don't learn that in church. You learn that in Sunday school first, and then you got to apply it when you get to church, right? So there's a found a spiritual foundation for people who go to go to church, but specifically a Southern Baptist black church, there's definitely a foundation. So think about Cheney University being founded in the city of Philadelphia in 1837, probably in the basement of a building, right? And because even though it was a free state, people probably didn't like the fact that blacks were educating themselves. Yeah. Learning to read, learning, learning to, to yeah. read. How did you learn to read? You went to church or you went to school. So either way, that school and that church was not in everybody's face. It was hidden. So Cheney University started in Philadelphia, probably in a basement. And then over time, migrated out to the suburbs. So and the name changed over the years. But the when Cheney was founded, the name of the school was the Institute of Colored Youth. How about that name? So it goes to show you where we were in that time, right? So Cheney has a long history of educating people of color. So when I got to Cheney, I was learning some of those things, and I probably forgot a lot of it until I did my research when I started writing my book. But those are the, the, the kinds of things that Black students, my classmates, a lot of them attended Cheney because it was the oldest HBCU, somebody in their family, if they're a legacy kid, somebody in their family attended there as well. And so I fell in love with Cheney. Cheney was a great school, had a great experience. It was similar to the experience I came from in terms of a predominantly black community, right? And so, yeah, I love Cheney. Yeah, and you mentioned it right there, but you had effectively still at this point, other than when you went to the summer camp for the Christian Fellowship Award that you won, you had not yet played on a team with a white guy. So Never. you were at Cheney, predominantly all black school. You had come from an all black school and we'll come back to the snow in a minute because th <laughs> that made me chuckle as a Canadian. But in, in one of your weekends off, you, you went to Villanova and you were playing a pickup basketball game with some guys. And one of the guys on your team was a white guy. And it was the first time you'd been teammates with a white guy. What did that feel like for you? Did it feel any different? And did it start to raise any questions in your mind relative to maybe the assumptions we grow up with about the other races? Well, for me, it was, um, and that's a great question, Clint. For me, it was, it was still different but not in the way people may think or in the way people have read other books about race. Mm -hmm. Remember, I had a foundation, a spiritual foundation. I grew up in the church, in my grandmother's church, but I also had a sports foundation, right? So the spiritual foundation is love thy neighbor as thyself, mm -hmm. turn the other cheek, right? Even though I grew up in the South, and I heard all kinds of horrible stories about how blacks were treated over time and over the years and so forth and so on. The preacher would still preach about loving everybody, right? Mm. Being kind yeah. to everybody, Beautiful. right? So I had a spiritual foundation and then I had a sports foundation, which is trust your teammate, right? Communicate, listen, you know, um, protect your teammate. You know, all of those things you hear coaches say to players during practice, right? Discipline, uh, don't be selfish, be selfless, you know, help each other, right? So when I got on the court for the first time <laughs> with Ted Aceto Jr., yeah, it was, it was different, but I didn't approach it with malice. I approached it with, okay, this is my first time playing with a, with, with a guy that doesn't look like me. I hope I can live up to it. I hope. I mean, first of all, I was dealing with 
my issues. Yeah, you weren't so, a basketball player. Yeah. Right, right. I was dealing with that more so than paying attention to. I mean, I realized he was white, and I and I realized I had never played with a guy that was white before. But I was more concerned with I want to play well. So my focus was not. Yeah, again, it was there, but my focus wasn't on, oh, I'm playing with a white guy. No, it was, okay, I want to win. Because in basketball, if you lose, you got to sit and wait to get back on the court. So my mind was totally not in in a negative fashion. It was more of a surprise that I was playing with a white guy versus a negative, oh, I'm playing with a white guy, right? So once we start playing, and I see this kid who's better at basketball than more than half the guys in the gym. I'm like, okay, I'm with this. This guy can play. I want to. So I know as a teammate, get the ball to the guy who can play. If you can't play and you get a rebound, you get the ball to the guy who can play. So I had no problem passing him the ball versus keeping it from him because he was white. No, I wanted to win. Get him the ball. He's embarrassing everybody. Get him the ball. So when you have that attitude, everything works out. And I'm sure from his perspective, receiving a pass from me, knowing he knew he was better than 75% of the guys in the gym, made him feel comfortable playing with me because I knew the only way I would gain respect from being on that court was getting a rebound. There was nothing else I could do to prove I was a good basketball player but get a rebound. And I used my football abilities and toughness to throw guys out of the way, elbow guys, beat them up, to get that rebound and get Ted Jr. the ball. And that's what I did. So we were able to build a a, a camaraderie that way. So for you, it was it was more just a, a mental curiosity, if you will, that, oh, this is this is the first time I've had a white teammate. It didn't necess- it didn't impact the way you played the game at all. It was just something to file away in the brain where you said, "Oh, that was something that I haven't done before. That was different." Something I hadn't done before. Absolutely. No, and it probably was better that he was on my team versus on the opposite, you know, the competitive five guys. So maybe maybe that made a, a bigger difference too. I, I don't know. Only thing I know is it didn't it didn't matter to me, but it was just my first it was a put it this way. From that moment on, like when I got to Cheney, that was a first. <laughs> when I tried out and walked out on the team, that was a first. I did a lot of things that were first, but then that was a real first, right? That was a different first, right? And then from that point on, everything else was a first but even more so, more amplified. Yeah, it started accelerating. Yeah, exactly. That's what I picked up on. That trip itself was also a first, and this was where it got exciting. So you started to realize as you were on that trip that it wasn't happenstance. You were effectively being recruited to come play football at Villanova, who was reinstating a team after about roughly three years off, I think. Correct. And... So I'm picturing this. You've done half a year at Cheney. Walk on to a Div 2 football team. Less than a season later, you're getting recruited to play for a Div 1 football team. Go back to when you were in high school. That was the dream. That was the dream. How did, how did that feel? Oh, I, it, was, it was an out-of-body experience. It, it mm. felt like everything mm. was coming full circle. Um, While I was at Cheney, um, you know, I I focused on preparing for spring football practice so I can make the team for the fall. I I fell in love and, and, you know, got my first girlfriend because I didn't date in high school because I was focused. Right. And my sisters wouldn't allow me. (laughs) And so things were falling into place. Right. And so all of a sudden. Uh, I get lucky, get invited to a party. I go to Villanova, which is in the, in, you know, maybe no more than 10 miles, 15 miles max away from Cheney. And it's my first time off of campus. And the guy who invited 
the group of us to Villanova was a Villanova basketball player. He was an all American. He was about to get drafted into the pros. And so the drive over from Cheney to Villanova, we're having a conversation. We're getting to know each other the same way you would if you meet somebody in a group for the first time. Right. How you doing? What's your name? What do you do? Right. We're all, you know, getting to know each other. I tell him I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a walk on on Cheney's football team and, you know, I'm happy to be at Cheney. And then where you're from, you know, we're, we're building a relationship. We're getting to know each other. By the time we get to Villanova, um, he knows something more about me. I know more about him. We have a great time at the party. We stay overnight, Friday night and Saturday night. And you say, well, how did you guys do that? Well, it was Easter break. So all the kids went home, or at least those who could afford to go home. And at Villanova, most people could afford to go home because Villanova is an affluent Catholic Irish Italian school. And so Happy Dobbs was the player's name who invited us over. He got the keys from some buddies of his who weren't going to be using their dorm room. They would be gone. So I had a room to myself on my visit. It was like going on a trip and having your own hotel room. So what I learned after the part, first of all, the party was put on by what's called the Black Cultural Society, one of the organizing groups on campus, you know, minority groups. Right. So. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks will will know, you know, if 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 you're at a school, there's lots of organizations. Right. So here was an organization um, created for black Americans. Right. And so the party was great. The students were great. They were a little different in their confidence than the students at Cheney. I noticed it. And. Let's be, I'll be frank. What I learned later was they were more confident and and had a little bit more cachet about them because of the school. You know, Villanova is one of the top schools, you know, top 50 schools in the country. Right. And so when you're talking about that kind of brand, I'll use that word. That kind of history, it's like going to Harvard, Yale, Penn, Princeton, right? Brown, the Ivy League schools, right? So Villanova is just, you know, a tad under those schools in terms of its reputation. So it felt different. And then the next morning, we get up to go to breakfast. And next thing I know, the cafeteria is in the dorm. And I'm like, hold on, this is a a dorm with a cafeteria in it? That was weird to me. Y yeah, uh, Happy said, oh yeah, it's also the nursing school. So if you are a nursing major, you come to this building for classes. I'm like, okay, that's awesome too. Then the next thing you know, we're passing a pool, Olympic sized pool in the building. I'm going, hold on, a cafeteria, a dorm, a, a hall for, for nursing and a pool? I'm like, no way. And in order to get to the basketball court, we pass the pool and then we get to the basketball court that's also in the building. In the same in the same building. Love I'm it. I'm going, this is crazy. There's no way this is a real university. There's no way this now this can't be real. But that was my introduction to Villanova. So of course I fell in love with it. I'm like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. Because at Cheney, there was only two dorms. A, a dorm for the guys and a, a dorm for the gals. That's it. In terms of living, we had to go outside to play sports. We had to go to another building to lift weights or whatever. There was no pool on the campus at Cheney University. I can tell you that. At least I don't remember it. So it was a total different environment. And so, of course, you know, if you've never seen anything like that, you fall in love with it. So I fell in love with it. Then I had an opportunity to meet Ted Aceto Jr.'s dad, the kid I played basketball with. It wasn't an issue for me to find out that Teddy Jr.'s dad was the athletic director because even though my high school had majority black students, 
meaning we had maybe one or two white students that I honestly can't don't even remember. I still had a few white teachers or white whites in the administration. So it didn't it wasn't a surprise. So I meet the athletic director. He tells me about and I already had learned how he long had played football there. And so that was exciting. And because everybody knew who Howie Long was, right? He had, as a rookie, won a Super Bowl championship with the Raiders. And so I find out that they're starting their football program up again because they dropped it after Howie Long got drafted to the Raiders, which was three years prior. Mm, So I saw an opportunity to transfer in at a higher level. Cheney was Division II, Villanova Division I AA. And so I said, wow, this is an opportunity that I need to think about. I don't want to turn down, but I need to think about it. And so I walked out before we left the campus. I walked out the gym to the turf football field. I had never seen turf before in my life. So I'm like, wow, they've got a turf football field. I was hook, line and sinker in terms of seriously thinking about transferring. And we left it with the athletic director saying, when you're done your semester and you go home, I'm going to send you some information. You fill it out and send it back, which would have been the application to apply to get into school. Yeah, and Bodine, so you get that. I mean, you're there Easter weekend. You spend the whole weekend. You're playing some basketball. You're hanging out with these guys. You're going to the party. You're looking around campus. You're seeing a lot of black people. Everything feels a okay. You love it. You're a great football team. It's got a similar feel and vibe, maybe a little more swagger than where where you were at Cheney. So when you're at home and you tell your family, you expect a lot of support. And then your sister, Pam, <laughs> has an exact opposite reaction. So can you maybe fill our listeners in on why Pam kind of gave you a slap upside the head? Well, again, I like to tell people I'm a slow learner, but a quick study. And being a person that was a late late bloomer, I assumed that Villanova, if it wasn't a black school, it was pretty close to a black school because I only saw the majority of black people when I was there. I didn't know it was an Irish, Italian, Catholic university, even if even if Happy Dobbs told me it was, I don't remember it. I only remember what my eyes saw and what I felt. Right. And I felt I was on the campus of a big elite black school. That's what it felt like. So I get home, I go back to Cheney, everything works out in terms of I finished the semester, everything's great. Um, I'm thinking about leaving. I asked one guy who, who was part of the Florida crew, a guy from Florida who were at, who was at Cheney and he was a senior graduating and he was about to try out for the Eagles. His name is Andre Waters. And I asked Andre because he was the upperclassman. I told him about my trip. I didn't tell very many people about my matter of fact. I don't think I only told two people about my trip, my girlfriend and Andre. And he gave me the extra push I needed to continue to think about transferring. He said, go for it. And that was great coming from him because he, as a Division II football player, 5'8", was about to try out for the Philadelphia Eagles. He had no shot coming from a Division II school, right? Most people would think. Guess what? He went on to have a a great career as an NFL football player for the Philadelphia Eagles. So him giving me that push was the same energy he was going to use to try out for the Philadelphia Eagles. So I went back to Florida. I told Reggie, who was my high school teammate, that I was thinking about transferring. And he was disappointed because we had talked about playing together for a long time, right? And that means something. When you're with someone on your team and you're from the same hometown and you're basically playing defense together, that's confidence you can't find, right? That's confidence you can't find. So he was disappointed. I then tell my sister, I waited till my Irish twin graduated high school, (laughs) right? I didn't want to bring blow up her time of graduating high school, because that's a big thing, right? I waited till after she graduated high school, which was probably a week or two after I got I got home. 
And then I said, I can't hold it in anymore. So I gather everybody around the kitchen table, Pam, my Irish twin, San, and my mom. And I say, listen, here's what's going on. I had a trip to Villanova. It's a great school. It's a black school. It's one. It's a. It's a really. It's a huge campus. It's got a pool. I. I, you know, I, I try to sell it all. And my mom, again, not a, a a high school graduate, was like, you know, okay, what does that mean? And my Irish twin was like, okay, I don't care. I got things to do. You know, she just graduated high school. She's ready to go hang out with her friends. And then Pam's like, you what? <laughs> you know, you hold on. You're doing what? And see, Pam is at another HBCU. She's at Bethune Cookman in Daytona Beach, right? So she's at a HBCU and she's living that HBCU life, pledging a sorority, right? Going through that experience. So she wasn't happy at all. She and also she had she kind of had a reason to. Her and my godmother that lived across the street put in the work to help get me into Cheney. To get you in. Mm -hmm. So I can understand that disappointment. At that moment, I may have understood that disappointment. But I overcame that because for so many years, I was doing what other people wanted me to do versus me doing what I wanted to do. Right. I was the good kid. If mom asked me to follow my sisters and go with my sisters to the mall, I had to do it. My brother was never asked to do that. I was asked. And that means something. Because if my sisters wanted to go shopping, they just didn't go to the black mall. They went to the white mall across the bridge on the other side of the river, or some people might say on the other side of the tracks. So if my sisters and their friends were going to the white side of town to shop, they needed protection just in case something happened. So I was always, and I'm a middle child. <laughs> so I'm always the one being asked to do this, do that, you know, uh, 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 taking the hand-me-downs from my brother in terms of clothes or shoes or whatever, or sports equipment, whatever, right? And this opportunity was my opportunity. I discovered that it's in my, you know, it's it's on my plate. And that's how I was thinking. My brother had a basketball court in the backyard. My uncles literally poured concrete and made a basketball court with the hoop in the backyard. Some some people may see a basketball hoop, you know, in the, you know, on a curbside, because nowadays they have their own foundation, right? But my brother had a basketball court in the backyard. I never had anything, like I didn't have a football field. I didn't have, you know what I mean? So, because my brother was a basketball player. So I I had to have a deep conversation with myself after my sister and my godmother and all the women in my family said, are you sure? Think about this. You don't know what that school, and my sister knew what it was about. She knew Villanova was a Irish, Italian, Catholic university. She even said to me, just because Georgetown University has all black players, and if you remember back then, they had who? Patrick Ewan. Just because Georgetown University has all black players and their coach, John Thompson, is a black man, doesn't mean Georgetown University is a black school. And that was her reply to me saying, Villanova, if not a black school, it has got a lot of black students. She's like, no, it don't. You're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, no. So that's what I had to deal with when I told her. And so... You ended up going for it and you thought to yourself, there's a chance she could be wrong. Fast forward to the start of the school year and you get to campus and she was absolutely right. You ended up actually in your temporary accommodations rooming with a white guy and predominantly most of the students you were seeing around campus were white. And I think some stats, not only that with, the, with your roommate, you got to practice, five out of 75 players were black and only one out of 11 coaches. So the basketball, like you said, was a first, but this, this for you, as you said, it was just amplified all of a sudden, totally different world than you're used to. What was that like when you first started playing in that environment? 
again, it was a first. I had to make adjustments, but I had a spiritual foundation and a sports foundation that I could fall back on. And what I mean by that is when I got off the and I when I traveled from Jacksonville to Philadelphia to come to Villanova, I took a train. That's a 17 and a half hour train ride by myself. Right. And so I was growing up every minute I was on that train by myself, because when I left to go to Cheney, I was with two other guys in a car. This was now on me. There was no one there else to help, no other support. I was now on my own as a, a real college student. And so when I arrived at Villanova, I get off the train and the campus is bigger than I imagined, right? The train dropped, literally dropped me off right in the front of Villanova. I could see the football field. I could see the big church, right? with the big crosses on it, right? <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, it's bigger than I thought. And the parking lot was full. The night that I visited, the parking lot wasn't full and I couldn't tell how big the parking lot was because I got there at night. So I get out and there are cars everywhere. I see BMWs, Porsches, Lamborghinis, Maseratis, Rolls Royces. I'm like, what? So it's immediately different. And then a guy I run into as I'm crossing the parking lot to head to the football locker room to check in, Italian guy, <laughs> he's got the gold chains around his neck. He's got the wife beater t-shirt on and he introduces himself and he thinks I'm a basketball player. And I say, no, football. He remembers, yeah, Villanova starting their football program up again. He offers me a ride. Not very far. I could literally see the football stadium where the football office is, but he still offered me a ride. So I took him up on it. So that was my first initial introduction to Villanova coming off the train. Then I walked from the football office to go to the register's office to register and do all the things you have to do as a freshman. And I didn't see one black person. Clint, I didn't see one person of color the whole walk from the football stadium to the center of campus. And I'm like, whoa. And I can hear my sister in my head. You idiot. <laughs> you you knucklehead. You were wrong. Right. I could hear her saying all those things to me. And I'm like, OK, she was right. Then I meet my first temporary roommate because the campus was overcrowded. More freshmen showed up than they anticipated. They didn't have enough room. Right. So they had to clear out office buildings and put temporary beds in in so kids can have a place to sleep. So my first temporary roommate, Shane Bo, dad was one of the assistant baseball coaches. And he and I got along great. He walked me around campus, showed me around, right? So that was a positive experience, right? It didn't hurt that his nickname was Shane Bo. His first name was Brian, but his Shane nickname, Bo and Bo D. Right. So we and he was you know, he looked like an athlete like I did. He was tall like me, built like me. You know, we were two tall guys, one white, one black. No big deal. He shows me around campus. We have a great time. And then a couple of days go by doing freshman orientation and I still don't see a black person. I'm like, wow. And then eventually I meet a black kid, black student. I was going to the bookstore to pick up some books. He was coming out of the bookstore and we meet, we, you know, we make eye contact and we go, OK, <laughs> there's the first black guy I see. <laughs> and so I, I probably hounded him. He introduced himself. I introduced myself and boom, there it was. So I started to feel a little bit more relaxed. Right. And he was able to take me to his dorm room, that same dorm room where I visited a few months earlier. And I was able to meet other black athletes and other black students. And then it was like, OK, I'm not the only one on this campus. Right. I knew I wouldn't be. I was at a party. Right. So I therefore I got a chance to meet a teammate, a potential teammate, a guy trying out for the team like me, Nate Booknight from Norristown. But the guy I met coming out of the library, Buzz, Buzz Bass is his name, took me back to his dorm. I meet folks that are hanging out in his room. He seemed to be the center of everything in terms of everybody like this guy. 
So people, you know, that guy that everybody likes to hang out in his room. <laughs> he was that guy. So I get back to his room. I meet Nate Booknight. They grew up together. Nate played football at Liberty. And Nate saw an opportunity like me to come back. For Nate, he was coming back home to play for a local team because maybe he was unhappy with playing at Liberty. So he was kind of in the same boat I was, transferring from another school. So when I found out he was a defensive player, oh, we hit it off great. I'm a defensive back. He's a defensive back. He's a strong safety. I can play strong safety, but fine. I can play free safety too. So we decided I'm going to try out for strong safety. He, I mean, free safety. He's going to try out for strong. We made that decision. That was our plan going into the locker room. A few days later, we go to the locker room for our first meeting. And you're right. I walk into the locker room. And there's only five black guys in a locker room. I'm one of them. The other was Nate. The next guy was Kevin, who was a defensive back, a defensive player, who I unfortunately don't remember his name, but he was a defensive lineman. And then there was only one black offensive player, and he was a running back, Frankie Baltimore from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. That was it. So I was like, whoa, this is, I, I never seen anything like this. I didn't even see anything like this on TV. Right on TV, you would see at least 50 50 or 40 60 in terms of ratio of black and white guys. I never saw anything like this. So, well, I did see it in high school. Let me let me uh, let me retract that. Yeah, in high school, that makes sense. We had a if we played a, a all white school, I saw it right. Yeah, but in terms of me personally being involved on a team like that, it, it was it was definitely new to me. And as you said, one black coach. And then what are the chances, Clint, that that one black coach would end up being my coach? The ratio was slim to none. Yeah. So he wasn't. And he wasn't. And, you know, fast forward a bit, because up until this point, you had always been that player who had potential. Maybe, maybe you'll be good. You got something, but it's not showing yet. And Coach Ferraro pulled you aside at one point and he said you were a good athlete, not just an athlete with potential. And I got chills when I read that part because you could tell, you know, it's ever since you were young and you tried out for basketball and you weren't allowed, you'd been wanting to show, well, wait a second. It's not just my big brother who's an athlete. I'm an athlete too. And you got that validation from Coach Ferraro. What, how, what did that conversation mean to you? Oh, it meant everything. Not only did I need it because of the examples you just talked about, not being able to allow to play as a kid, playing pickup basketball with other peers growing up and not being as good as them at basketball, having to prove myself, right? Getting switched from defense to offense, right? It's not just getting switched and me being disappointed. It's your peers. What do your peers think? Oh, well, he got moved from defense to offense because he ain't good enough. Where the coaches are saying, no, 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 you're good enough, but you're so good. We need you here to protect our quarterback. I got moved to left tackle. I was protecting the blind side of my quarterback. That's how valuable I was. Did Right. Did it mean that much to me as a kid or in high school? I didn't know. Right. The movie Blindside. You've seen it. Right. Did we know how important left tackles were until recently? Right. So I had no idea that that's what the coaches were thinking. We need the toughest kid on the team to protect our quarterback. So I didn't know that. So when you have all those experiences, Clint, you know, deniability, feeling rejected, not playing the position you, you you supposed to play, having all those experiences, have a white coach, the first white coach who I was struggling to, I was struggling to allow him to help me and make me a better player, right? I was struggling with that because of his coaching style. So here's a great example. I had all black men coaches my whole entire career, which is not a long career. Right. But I had all black men coaches. I had black men coaches yell at me. I had black men coaches grab my face mask and pull me in to get to prove a point or to get a point across. Right. That's the way coaches coach back then. I never had a white coach pull my face mask and yell at me. That was the difference. 
So I had to get used to that, right? Of course. Yeah, because you, Bodine, like you don't know, right? Like, is he pulling me in and yelling in my face because I'm a football player? Or is he pulling me in and yelling in my face because I'm a black football player? Or he don't like me. Yeah, yeah. Right? And does it have any, yeah. And does it have anything to do with that? Right. So how did I overcome that, Clint? My immediate teammates. And what I mean by my immediate teammates, my defensive back teammates. Because when you think about groups, you have your defensive back group, you have your linebacker group, you have your your defensive line group. So my group right. of defensive backs, cornerbacks, safeties, free safeties, right? We all hung together more than any other group. They helped me overcome those issues. Like Nate Booknight would say, Bo, he's coaching you up the same way a black coach would coach you up. And then I'd have a white teammate, Jay Curcio or Bobby Rosado say, hey, he's a player's coach, Bo. I know players coaches from a salesman, right? There's a difference between a player's coach and a coach people consider a salesman, right? So mm -hmm, I was getting mm -hmm. all this reinforcement from my immediate teammates. So what I had to do was give the same level of respect to my white, hit, my white position coach as I did to my black position coaches. And once I was able to give him the same level of respect, that meant I was allowing him to coach me to make me better. And that conversation that he and I had helped me get to that point, along with my teammates and along with him showing personal interest in me. Because, you know, you've heard it. If a coach is on you, that means he likes you and he wants you to be better. If a coach thinks you can't help, they don't care. They're not going to even be bothered with you. I heard that also growing up. So I just had to get past the lack of diversity, meaning Jay Curcio, Bobby Rosado, my white teammates, and Nate Booknight all had black coaches coach them and white coaches coach them. So they had experience in diversity. I was the one lacking in it. So by them helping me, allowed me to mature and evolve faster. Mm. We sometimes, when we're talking about stuff like that at work, we call it, you're effectively, they had the experience coming in, whereas you're trying to build the airplane while you're flying, right? You're, you're right, in, uh, right at ground zero on it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So we'll have a link to the book in our show notes. How else can our listeners find you, Bodine? Um, well, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, they can go to my website, bodinesanders.com. And if you Google it, it's pretty easy. Bo, B-O hyphen, Dean, D-E-A-N, sanders.com. That's my website. All the information is on my website. And, uh, you know, they can find the book at their favorite online retailer, be it Barnes and Noble, Amazon, whoever. And uh, yeah. And, and 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 if they want to send me an email, they can go to my website and send me an email. I, I try to do my best to return emails because believe in a lot of people have questions. A lot of people notice things. A lot of people need some help sometimes when I pivot to a different topic, because it's seven chapters, 42 topics, and those topics are relatable and they can find out something they didn't know as well. Thank you for being on The Pursuit of Learning. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on The Pursuit of Learning. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and head over to our website, thepursuitoflearning.com, where you will find our show notes, transcripts, and more. If you like what you see, sign up for our mailing list. Until next time, your host in learning, Clint Murphy.